So again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. I am very aware that this is a diverse group of people who are listening today, and we have uh, survivors and parents, uh, patient advocates, healthcare professionals, and so forth. And so one of my main goals today is to really make our research accessible to this broad audience and sort of give you a summary, a, a year in the life of what we've been doing in the lab and what sort of cool experiments we've been doing. So today I really divided the story into three parts, uh, what we study and why we study it, uh, what we have done in terms of recently published data and what we are doing. And for this, I'm really talking about the three S's, subgroups, selumetinib and serendipity. And for the first part, I'm just gonna go over what medulloblastoma is and why it's divided into these different types of tumors or subgroups. In the second part, we're going to go over this drug that we found, selumetinib, that we found to be quite effective in a particular subgroup of medulloblastoma, another S word, uh, sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. And then the third part, I'm going to tell you about what we're doing now. And with all the animal studies and preclinical work we've been doing, the last year and a half has been challenging, and we've had months of complete shutdowns and restart and scalebacks and with that, uh, with some of the work we were doing, I'll tell you about our serendipity and a little bit of luck that really led us in exciting new innovative directions and we're able to dissect our, our, our tumors and our, and our animal models in, in a much more innovative way now and ask really cool and new and interesting questions. So first of all, what is this medulloblastoma tumor? So unlike the tumor that McKenna was discussing, which is the most, uh, it is the most common pediatric brain tumor, medulloblastoma, on the other hand, is the most common malignant or highly aggressive primary brain tumor in children. So it develops in the uh, dorsal brain stem or the cerebellum, so the region responsible for coordination and uh, movement, but it is really now considered a very, very diverse disease, very diverse indeed. And we call this heterogeneous, or it has a lot of heterogeneity. And we could even see that even before 10 years ago, before all of the sequencing and molecular profiling of this disease was taking place. So this is an example, two examples of what, when we look under a microscope at a sample, what that would look like. And already you can see that these two different samples, A and B, look different. And in A here, this is an example of a staining that we would typically use in pathology specimens called hematoxylin and eosin. And all that really does is stain for morphology and looking at the size and the cells and the structure of the tissue, where the nuclei, the nucleus in each cell is stained this dark purple or blue, and the cytoplasm outside the nucleus is stained pink. And so what you can see here and what I'd like you to appreciate is that these cells in this particular tumor, some of the nuclei are really big, some are small, some are elongated, some are not, but really for lack of a better word, they're just messed up cells within these tumors. So they look very, very different and there's lots of diversity or heterogeneity. On the second sample here, you can see this is stained, the, the sample is stained for a marker called Ki67. And using the technologies that we use, anything that's positive will light up in brown, okay? And so you can see here, there's these nodules, this nodule in the middle, this circular nodule, and inside that nodule, there's really no brown. So it's really staining mostly negative for this marker of what we call dividing cells or proliferating cells. But around that nodule, you can see lots of positivity or dividing cells. So this sample is diverse in that you have a mixture of cells that are actively growing and dividing and cells that are not. And so what I would like you to get out of this is that even when we look under the microscope, there is some diversity. But the key is here, up until about 10, or 9 or 10 years ago, what could happen is we could have two tumors under the microscope that do actually indeed look very similar, but the outcome is very different. And so why is that? And that's because in the last nine to 10 years, we've really moved forward in this field with molecular and genetic subgrouping of these tumors. And so this has really been led by three groups from around the world, groups at SickKids in Toronto, 
uh, St. Jude's in the States, as well as Heidelberg in Germany. And because sequencing technologies now have really come down in price and they've become more affordable and more people are using them in labs, medulloblastoma is now not just a disease that we look at under the microscope, but it really is one we classify based on molecular and genetic diversity or heterogeneity. And what that means is we now divide these tumors into at least four different subgroups. And we call them Wnt, Hedgehog, Group 3, and Group 4. And the Wnt's and the Hedgehogs, they're named after uh, signaling pathways. So a series of events inside the cell that activate different proteins and do things inside the cells. And this is named after a pathway called Wnt, this tumor. And these children do incredibly well and they rarely spread or metastasize. The tumor that I'm focusing on today are the sonic hedgehog tumors. And much to my six-year-old's delight, it said sonic hedgehog is indeed named after Sonic the Hedgehog in the video game. And these tumors are driven by this particular pathway. And then we have group three and group four. And we call them this because we still don't know a lot about the pathways or the cascades inside the cell that actually drive those tumors. But in reality, the group three tumors actually do spread quite frequently and they probably have the worst prognosis out of all of the different groups. But what I want you to get out of this is really that even though you can have two tumors that do look the same under the microscope, you can have a group three and a Wnt tumor that look very similar, but in reality, they have very different outcomes with extensive genetic, molecular, as well as clinical diversity. And as we've been able to subgroup these tumors, this gets incredibly more complex over time. And I've been asked to give talks to uh, my kids' classes at school, elementary school classes, as well as at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada walks. And I talk frequently to families and children about what this means. And a couple of years ago, my students, my wonderful students, came up with a way of actually simplifying this and explaining it. And for those parents my age, 40 plus, who grew up with the original version of the Ninja Turtles, or if you have kids who watch the many reboots of these, you will understand what I mean. And this is how we explain it. We talk about the Ninja Turtles and we say they all look similar in that they all are turtles, they all have awesome ninja skills, but in reality, they all have very different personalities. Raphael, sometimes he's a lot more aggressive. Michelangelo, sometimes he's a little bit immature. So they all have to be handled and treated differently. And when I explain this to kids in this way, they actually understand what I mean. And they say, oh, you're working on a Raphael. He's got a bad attitude and we have to treat him differently. And even sometimes these turtles, they have good days and sometimes they have bad days. And the reason why I say that is because even within each group, each subgroup, like sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma, there's still additional substructure, there's still additional diversity. This is a very complicated slide, but I'm going to simplify it and just say that they're divided into alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And, and we know that there, there's variation based on the ages of the patients. So you can see here, this one is more frequent in older children. The betas and the gammas are more frequent in infants. And then we have the deltas that are more frequent in actually adult populations. And within all of these tumors that are called hedgehog, we have diversity in terms of the spread, the overall survival, and even their molecular profiles. So for cell biologists like me, every year this keeps getting more and more and more complicated. And as it gets more complicated, we see these large published papers, these sequencing papers, and they have lots of lists lots of lists of genes that distinguish these different groups. And we find this very complicated. And this makes it very difficult to actually know what to work on. When I see these lists of genes from these big data sets, I need to figure out what I'm going to work on and how I'm going to test it. And, and so this really sums up very quite elegantly where our field is at right now. There's these large computational studies that have found all the genes that are different between different subgroups. And then you have traditional cell biologists and neurobiologists like myself that traditionally we're used to working on a one gene, one hypothesis sort of experiment or one pathway. And I think the best of both worlds is really where we're going with all of this, 
we need to take those lists. We need to study function and why these genes are important. And then we have to go back and looking at the patient samples and, and looking at the relevance of, of what we find. So, so in reality, in this era of big data sets and really complex diagnoses, how do we figure out which of those lists of genes to work on and how do we choose this more specifically what to work on? So this is where my lab comes in. And, and as was mentioned in the introduction, nobody in my lab, where none of us are MDs, we are basic scientists. And so my lab really sits sort of in the middle, smack dab in the middle between basic science where we use cells in a dish. We love, that's my favorite thing to do is look at cells in a dish. We manipulate genes, we, we overexpress genes, we knock out genes, we add a lot of drugs to cells in a dish. And we do all those experiments and then we go and see if something works in preclinical models, uh, in our animal models of disease. And the hope is that when we can show effectiveness in those models, then we can speak to our clinician colleagues about potential clinical trials. And that's where we're at with this project right now and which is why I'm showing you this today. And we use many, many different approaches to study how specific genes of interest regulate how medulloblastoma ticks. And one of the type of cell we work on, and you might have heard this in previous webinars by other research scientists, another cell type we're interested in working on are these cancer stem cells or progenitor cells within medulloblastoma tumors. We want to target those cells specifically. Why? It's because these cells really sit at the root of the disease. They, within a tumor, they drive the tumor, they fuel the growth of the tumor, and they're also responsible for, for drug resistance and they contribute to relapse as well. And these tumors are believed to really be a disorder of very early brain development. And it's believed that the cell of origin really are these stem cells and these progenitor cells that really just get messed up through different mutations and so forth. And if these stem and progenitor cells, normally they change into something else during development. But if they're abnormal and they stick around and they form a tumor, then we could potentially exploit what makes those cells unique. What are their cellular fingerprints? And we can compare those to what would be considered normal. And this may lead us to be able to develop better therapies to specifically target these abnormal medulloblastoma cells while leaving the normal brain cells intact. And the overall goal here would, find, would be finding a targeted therapy that kills the cancer stem cell, but doesn't have any toxic effects on the developing brains of young children. And when I say these stem cells really are the root of the disease, the, the analogy the lab likes to use is really killing the cancer weeds at the roots. And so if you imagine a you know, a lawn full of dandelions in the summertime or in the spring. And if you were to take uh, just scissors and then cut those dandelions really at the stem, you wouldn't see those dandelions for a couple of days, but then they'll grow back quickly. And this is similar to, in, in some cases, how in some of the most aggressive medulloblastoma, current treatment will actually work at times. But what we wanna do is find better, more targeted therapies either one drug, but more than likely a cocktail of drugs that will target these dandelions at the roots. This will lessen the likelihood that these will come back or will really knock them out for a long period of time. So my lab, I have a bunch of people past and present who worked on this project that I'm gonna speak about today. We are really looking at cellular fingerprints to identify new markers specifically for these hedgehog tumors. We work on other medulloblastoma as well, but for this project, we wanna look at their fingerprints to see what's unique about those cells and can we target those cells with specific types of therapies. And we're really looking into new combination therapies for this disease. So this is the end of part one. I hope I told you a little bit about medulloblastoma and why studying these subgroups is very important in splitting them into their different types. So in the second part of my talk, I'm going to tell you about this drug called selumetinib as a potential new treatment for hedgehog medulloblastoma tumors. And our origin story for this goes back about six or seven years. And we were looking at and what I call cellular fingerprints so markers on the surface of the cells that 
would be identifiers for these tumors. And we found a marker that sits on the surface of these cells called CD271. And this is really cool marker because it has a lot of different functions. Now this complicated diagram on the right is really for any scientist in the room, but what I want you to get out of this is just that this is the marker. It interacts with lots of different things outside the cell and inside the cell. And as a consequence of that, it can do many different things in the cell and in many different contexts. So it plays a lot of different roles in the developing nervous system. And in fact, it's actually been shown to play a very important role in other brain tumors like gliomas in terms of invasion and motility. But interestingly enough, as we're interested in these stem cells or progenitor cells, for other cancers, like for example, melanoma, it's been shown to be a selective marker for those cancer stem cells. So a fingerprint in other tumors. So we thought this was a really cool marker to look at. And what we found in some of our earlier studies was that this marker is nearly exclusive to sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas. And we were using a small subset of patient samples and we stained them. And we found it was really only expressed in these hedgehog tumors. And we predicted that it may actually have diagnostic value. And we also found that this marker selects for a cancer stem or progenitor cell. So we wondered if they had a real unique signature, these cells that were specific for this marker that we could exploit therapeutically. And this led to this paper in 2018 uh, by my amazing former PhD student, uh, Lisa Lang, now a postdoc in Calgary in which we found that CD271 positive cells are diagnostic, prognostic, and they exhibit elevated activity for another signaling pathway. And I call that the MAP kinase pathway, and it has other names as well, which you'll see. And this is all specific to the hedgehog medulloblastoma tumors. So that was the paper, and I'll just give you a couple of tidbits and pieces of information from that paper now that are important. So I told you that this marker or fingerprint on the surface of the cell seems to be only expressed in hedgehog tumors. So we wanted to back that up with more samples. So we were able to get over 60 samples from Calgary and SickKids, and we stained them for CD271. And again, whenever you see positivity using the techniques we're using, it, the sample's gonna light up in brown. So if it's the sample or the marker you're looking for is there, you're gonna see brown staining. So you can see here, we took samples from the Wnt tumors, the hedgehogs, the group threes and the group four. And I think what's pretty evident here is that for CD271, only the hedgehog tumor is lighting up brown. So we said, well, that's cool. It seems to be exclusive. And then we said, well, let's add another marker in there. And we use this other marker called OTX2. It happens to be the other protein that we work on in the lab as well. And that's a different project. But what's really interesting about this is that this marker is expressed in everything but sonic hedgehog tumors. So you see the brown is very high in the wince, the group threes and the group fours, but nothing in the hedgehog tumors. So we predicted that potentially down the road, we could use a combination of these two markers where anything that has CD271 positivity, but it's negative for OTX2, could be used as a diagnostic tool for hedgehog tumors. And we asked our good friend and collaborator, Dr. Vijay Ramaswamy at SickKids to look at this in an even larger sample subset and looking at RNA levels instead of protein. He used 763 patient samples and he could see then that that same pattern held. So here, all of the tumors that are hedgehog are represented by the red bars here. And I think what you can see here is compared to the other groups, again, CD271 is very high whereas OTX2 is lower relative to the other groups in hedgehog tumors. So we thought, well, this is really cool. We might be able to use this combination as a diagnostic tool, but we're a bunch of cell biologists in the lab. So we said, that's great, but what do CD271 cells do? What distinguishes a positive cell from a negative cell? So then we worked our cell magic in the lab and we took all of our cells in a dish and we stained them for CD271, and we used a fluorescently labeled antibody for this. And we put them through a machine, and we asked the machine to, tell, to give us the positive cells and the negative cells. And when we do that, we send those cells for sequencing, and we specifically ask the question, what is the difference between them? 
What makes a positive cell a positive cell and a negative cell a negative cell? And this is what we got back. Again, this is a complicated image, but I'll simplify it. So we were asking for pathways. Again, these signaling cascades that signal to proteins inside the cell to tell the cell what to do. So the blue bars here represent all of the pathways that are higher in the positive cells. And you can see there are a lot of them. Whereas the red bars represent the pathways that are down. And what we really wanted to know, what are the pathways that were up? in the CD271 positive cells. And I highlight this one here, it's called the mec erc or MAC kinase signaling pathway. And we were really interested in this one because at the time, no one had ever looked at it in hedgehog tumors before. So we thought we might be able to come up with something innovative and unique for these tumors. And what do we look for when we choose with pathway to work on? We're not clinicians, but we are again, generally aware of what's going on with clinical trials in the literature. So we have three questions. Are there drugs available to target that pathway? Can those drugs penetrate the brain? That's extremely important for brain tumors as opposed to other tumors in the body because of the blood brain barrier. And three, are these drugs already in clinical trials? And importantly, are there drugs in clinical trials for other children's brain tumors that we could look at the data and do they have a very good efficacy and low toxicity profiles in kids? And we were excited about this because for the mec erc signaling pathway, the answer to all three of those questions was yes. There are drugs that do all of those things. And the drug that we were interested in here was selumetinib. Selumetinib is indeed brain penetrant. And selumetinib, as well as other inhibitors, are actually currently in clinical trials for the treatment of low-grade gliomas in children, as well as plexiform neurofibromas. And in fact, I believe selumetinib was just approved actually last year for plexiform neurofibromas. And from at least from what I've seen in the clinical data, it has shown very good efficacy and excellent tolerability in both conditions in children. And so it is conceivable that if this drug works in our hedgehog models, we could potentially move this into a clinical trial for medulloblastoma tumors as well, obviously in partners with our clinician colleagues. So we did what we normally do in the lab. We play with the cells in a dish, and then we moved into animal models. And so we did a lot of experiments in a dish, like a year and a half's worth of experiments. And I'll just show you one here, just because it's, it's a nice obvious image of what we, what we saw. So we looked at migration and how these cells are moving in a dish. And we make these little aggregates of cells and we put them in a gel, and then we follow the movement of those aggregates over a few days. And the arrows here show how far they get in the same period of time. So what I think you can see here, as we increase the concentration to a stronger and stronger dose, you see here that you get less and less migration. And you can see it here when we quantified that, as we increase the dose, migration is less and less and less. And we see this not just for migration, but we're able to slow down the cells, we're able to kill the cells, we're able to lower CD271 levels. And this was fantastic. So after about a year and a half, we were actually ready to go into animal trials. And what was exciting about this is it worked in our animal model as well of sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. And so this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. And it's a survival data and the Black bars represent the, the, the number of animals that are alive at a particular day, and the blue bar represents the drug-treated tumors. And what you can see here is that relative to the controls or the animals treated with just a vehicle solution, we do see a significant enrichment or enhancement of survival. So that was really exciting with this drug. And as would be expected for a drug targeting cells that are positive for CD271, you can see here, again, when we stain and we see the lighting up of the brown marker uh, with CD271, when we treat with selumetinib, that brown staining obviously is going down quite a bit. And so this was where our 2018 paper ended. We were really excited. We found a pathway that was new to the sonic hedgehog tumors. It's upregulated specifically in these cellular fingerprints, the CD271 positive population. And it's specific to hedgehog tumors. And we find that drugs like selumetinib, which are in clinical trials, are already approved for other neural tumors in children. 
that they decrease CD271 levels. It decreases a whole bunch of tumor properties in a dish, including growth, uh, migration, and survival. It just wipes them out at high concentrations. And importantly, in our animal model, we see a survival improvement, a decrease in growth, and a decrease in the CD271 cells as well. So this is where we were at at late 2018, 2019. But we thought we could do better. The cellulomet have treated animals, they still progress. And we wanted to improve this further. And we still believe that we could improve this further. So this leads to part three, which I call serendipity and how a little bit of luck goes a long way. And while we were trying to do all these really intense animal studies, that's when COVID hit. And we needed a little bit of luck to finish this because we were shut down for three and a half months and then we started up and then there was scale back again. And so it was difficult to get these studies done, but we're really excited as the work I'm gonna show you now is, is under review. It's not published yet, but it's under review. And we're really pumped about these results because we think we found some drugs in combination that actually seem to work even better. And so when we went back to our cellumitinib treated animal studies, we said, well, we're inhibiting one pathway with cellumitinib. Something else has to be compensating for it because the animals still progress, right? The animals still will die eventually. So we asked the question, well, if we take these tumors from the controls and we take out the tumors that are treated with cellumitinib and we sequence them, and we look at all of the genes that are up and down, just like lists of genes, but with a very specific question. What goes up in cellumitinib treated tumors? Because what goes up must come down. So we hypothesized that if we could find a pathway that was up when we treat with cellumitinib, and if that pathway could be targeted by brain penetrant drugs, then they could be candidates for combination drug therapy. And so that took many, many months to do, but we finally got our results. And there were several pathways that were actually up when we treat with cellumitinib. And I'm gonna show you the one that we went after. And this pathway is called the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. And we found it was up when we treated the animals with cellumitinib. And again, this is a complicated diagram, but it just does show in, a, in an elegant way what's happening. So if you imagine all of the genes that are relevant to cellumitinib on the left, and all the genes that are relevant to the control on the right. And we have the zero line here. And what you see here is that anything having to do with this JAK-STAT signaling pathway, you can see this nice curve going up, 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 up on the cellumitinib side. So what this tells us when we look at it is all the genes associated with this JAK-STAT pathway, they're enriched here in the cellumitinib treated tumors, but not in the controls. So we went on to stain our tumors again to validate this finding like we always do. And I said, when we use this technology, anything that's positive will light up in brown. And you can see here, these are two independent control animals. We see mostly blue, so mostly negative. There's a little bit of brown staining, but there's not a lot. But then you look in the cellulomit and treated tumors and you do see a definitive increase in the readout for that particular pathway. So we said, okay, this is definitely going up when we treat these cells and treat these tumors with cellulomitinib. But it seems like in the controls, the levels are quite low. The activity is quite low. So we wanted to know what was actually happening in patient tumors as well, uh, that were like control or untreated tumors. And so we actually scanned, whoops, actually, that's, I'll go back one second. So first we wanted to talk about why we wanted to pursue this pathway in the first place. Uh, there are brain penetrant JAKSTAT3 pathway inhibitors, which is very exciting. And we tried many different drugs, but I'm going to just show you the one drug that we had that worked in combination called Pacritinib. And what's really interesting about this is that in other cancers, melanoma, gliomas, other types of cancers, when those tumors are treated with cellumitinib and other drugs, it seems like this JAK-STAT pathway is going up across the board in a variety of different cancers. So we actually think, this is, we think that this is a general mechanism of drug resistance that we should go after. And so not only would our findings be important to the neuro-oncology community, but we think it would be of interest to people studying other cancers as well. But like I said before, which I was getting at before I presented that slide, was that we really wanted to know 
what was happening in patient tumors. And again, this is a complicated slide, but I'm going to simplify it. And so we looked at over 200 different pediatric brain tumors divided into seven different categories. Each of these columns here is a, is a tumor, and they're all grouped by color into their different type. So what you can see here is the medulloblastomas are all the purple tumors on the right. And the genes associated with this JAK-STAT pathway are all listed here. What they are is not important. What I want you to see is the pattern. So the pattern would be if it's highly expressed, you see it light up in red. And if it's not expressed or very lowly expressed, you would see it in blue. And what you can appreciate here is if you look at that medulloblastoma tumors on the right, in both cases, it's very obvious that they're kind of lighting up blue, meaning that the expression levels for this pathway are a lot lower in medulloblastoma relative to other pediatric brain tumors. So what this told us, in addition to our animal models, is that the base levels of this pathway are actually lower in medulloblastoma. And it seems to be something that's activated upon drug treatment. So we think that this is associated with drug-induced treatment resistance. So after a lot of testing, a year during COVID of testing this in a dish, we were ready for animal trials. But would this combination therapy work? And would it be toxic? And the reason why this is important is because in brain tumors, even in animal models, before you even get to clinical trials, you have to get the right balance. You may have two drugs and they may actually be effective, but you have to stop the animal trials early because they cause toxicity. On the flip side, you may be able to get those concentrations down to reduce toxicity but then what happens after that is that they don't have any effect anymore. So it's really about finding the right balance in brain tumor models. So after a year of a lot of due diligence and testing, we're really happy to report that the combination therapy is actually non-toxic and further increases survivals in hedgehog models. So this is a really important slide and I'll take you through it. So the first thing we did is we tried that JAK stat inhibitor pacritinib. It's known to be really potent. So we tried different concentrations. And since I told you that the base levels of the pathway are not really high, we didn't expect this drug on its own to actually do a lot, and it didn't. And we didn't see any toxicity effects with pacritinib. And so we took the middle ground. We said, let's take 50 mg per kilogram and combine it with selumitinib and let's just see what happens. And we treat these using, uh, an or we treat them orally, the animals, the same way children would be treated. And we do this on five days a week schedule with a two day break on the weekend. And we call that a drug holiday. And we follow their weights over a period of a few weeks. And usually if there's toxicity issues with the combination, you see the animals lose weight quickly and we'd have to terminate the experiment early. But not only did the combination therapy depicted here by the red lines, the animals sustained their weight, but they continued to gain weight over the beginning of the experiment. So this was really exciting because this means that we had the right doses, we thought, the right treatment regimen, and it wasn't toxic. And then what you see down here are the survival data from one of our experiments. And relative to the controls, which are in black, again, you can see that selumitinib, it does increase survival. But we were super excited because the combination therapy further increased survival even further. We tried this in a group three model as well. And while we had glimpses of improvement, at least at this combination or at this concentration, we didn't see the effect in group three. We thought this was specific to sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma tumors. And so being cell biologists, we wanted to understand why. We wanted to make sure we understood why the survival was improving. So we did additional experiments and we repeated them. And this time we took the tumors at the halfway point to see if we could see any growth differences between them. And this was exciting again, because now we're starting to get an indicator as to why the survival is better. So again, these are images, they're stained with a, a marker so that the tumor will light up in brown. And you can see here, this is an example at a lower magnification of a large vehicle tumor treated with each drug individually. And then you see this teeny tiny tumor here when treated with the combination. And these are just higher magnification images of that. And then we added two more tumors here to show that it wasn't a one-off or a one-time thing. 
And the cool thing about this is when we did the statistical testing, we could see very clearly here that each drug alone, yes, it did decrease growth midway, but the combination therapy really inhibited tumor growth in these animals. And I believe this was after over 50 days of treatment. And then we actually got this data only a couple of weeks ago. And we repeated this whole experiment in a second model of sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. And these are MRI images of the tumors, three tumors from each group. And you can see here, lighting up sort of in white are the tumors. The vehicles, you could see the large tumor and then additional extensions of that tumor on the sides of the cerebellum. And you can see that in all three, almost like a triangle. But in the pacritinib treated tumors, actually this was somewhat effective in this model. Pacritinib, you don't see those extensions. You see them more encapsulated like little balls. And in the selumitinib, it was variable. But again, with the combination therapy treated tumor, it was even slightly better than pacritinib alone with a teeny tiny tumor here. And this was very exciting to us as this was a new model for us and one that we hadn't worked on previously. And we were really excited about this, but then again, as cell biologists, in the last five minutes of my talk, I will talk to you about how we dissected this even further. We know they're growing slowly, but why are they growing slowly? But we were stuck. Last summer, we had all of these slides and all of these samples, but we couldn't do anything with them because we couldn't get into the lab for three months. So we were looking for a little bit of luck or serendipity. And that happened, and the person's name was Stephanie Jefferson. And she was from a company in Washington called Nanostring. And she wanted to know if we wanted to test their new platform. And this is called digital spatial profiling. And people are using this now with patient samples. And the cool thing about this platform is that you can see not only how much of a protein is being expressed, but where that protein is being expressed in tumor samples. And more importantly, you don't just stain for one marker at a time, but you can stain for dozens and dozens of proteins at one time. And in our case, we were able to look at 56 different antibodies all at once in one different slide to see what is happening in our tumors. We stain them with fluorescently labeled antibodies so the tumors light up. And then with the company, we pick these ROIs and these are called regions of interest. And then it's complicated technology, but in a nutshell, what happens is is the company, we pick those regions of interest and then they give us information on all of the antibodies that we're interested in, in those regions and they map it back onto the tissue. So in this way, in one shot, we get dozens of antibodies at once as opposed to one every few days. So this is phenomenal technology. And this is what our samples look like when we stain them to have the tumor light up and pick our regions of interest. You can see here for every tumor, we pick 12. So the circles were our regions of interest in the middle of the tumor and the rectangles we drew were our regions of interest along the edge of the tumor. So the vehicle, really big tumor, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller and the combination therapy one that was just teeny tiny. And we said, well, if this platform is working and it's cool, then we should be able to see some of the same patterns we saw previously as a validation tool. So we went back to our trusty CD271 and we said, well, selumitinib always lowered that. Do we see that here? So now what's, what's really cool is that we can see all of the different regions of interest. And this is called a heat map, where everything that's really strong is in blue and everything that's weaker is in white. So you can see for all of these 12 regions of interest that we selected, expression is really high in the vehicle. It's somewhat variable with pacritinib, it's going down as we would have predicted in selumitinib, and it's going down even more in the combination therapy treated sample. And this is when we quantified it. And so we see that indeed this platform is telling us similar things to what we had seen previously with other technology. And there's nothing a scientist likes more than to validate your findings using a different method. But what we were really interested in were all of these dozens of proteins. And I won't go all over, over all the data. I'll just show you kind of what's handed to us when we get the readout. We get what we call a volcano plot. And it's called the volcano plot because it takes on this V shape here. And what it tells us is what's higher in the control on the left and what's higher in the drug treated samples. And you can see this is a selumitinib treated sample. There's only one yellow dot here. 
that was higher in the drug treated sample. Everything, almost everything was higher in the controls, meaning it's down regulated upon treatment. What these experiments tell us, they can tell us not only is the drug still working, is it hitting its target, and even what's happening in the combination therapy treated samples that might predict whether you could get relapse in the future. So this combination and this technology is just absolutely fascinating. And so to conclude, I think we've used many different approaches and our study reveals new insight into how tumors can change following drug treatment. And we do believe that using our models, we've shown that both pacritinib and selumitinib may actually have benefit in hedgehog medulloblastoma tumors. And as final thoughts, We've used a lot of different techniques to look at how manipulating certain genes of interest affect cell function in a dish, as well as in animal models. And we also use a lot of different drug treatments to, in the same type of model system. We think we have a novel combination of drugs. We've been speaking to uh, people who are involved with clinical trials about what we would further need to do to move into a clinical trial. And we're even looking at some of the best in class MEK inhibitors, in addition to selumitinib, like trapmetinib, which is FDA approved and is being used off label now. So, and other drugs that actually target CD271 directly. So we have a lot of work to do and we're using a lot of really cool animal studies and technologies to look at it. But I think we're really making some dents here in some novel uh, combination therapies that may actually have value in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab members, past and present working on this, my kids, my honorary lab members, as well as my collaborators who work really well with me on these projects. And of course, our funding agencies, especially the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, which has been very supportive of people working on this project as well as the project itself. So thank you very much.